Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, AI and IP Forward Looking Strategies. My name is Greg Graminopoulos, and joining me today for today's presentation is Elisa Carino and Elliot Cook. Before we begin, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar. So please just click on the red Q&A button on the lower center of the webcast interface and type in your question into the window, then click Submit. The questions will be answered today during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And we, again, encourage everyone to submit their questions. If we're unable to address your question during today's presentation, we will try to follow up with you individually by email. You may enlarge in the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge Window button on the, type, uh, the top right side of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Webcast Help Guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. We encourage everyone to uh, review materials on Finnegan's website, including articles on AI and our webinars, which are posted for playback after the live presentation is completed. Some of you had uh, participated in our first AI webinar, which was conducted on November 2nd. That webinar is available now for playback on our website. With that, let's begin our presentation, AI and IP forward-looking strategies. We thought it would be helpful to first provide an overview of what we'll be covering today. We have um, essentially four main topics or areas that we want to cover. Uh, first, we'll again take a look at what is AI, uh, what, is, what is artificial intelligence. And this is a topic we covered in the first webinar, but we'll re-look uh, at that question and uh, try to put some context around what is AI and how, and more importantly, uh, it's being defined relative to IP and in, in particular patents. We'll then take a look at what can be patented. Um, Elliot will review several patents um, in this area, in the AI space. Um, many of you had, had seen from our first webinar that the number of filings in the AI space have increased dramatically over the last 10 years. And we've done a sample of those patents, uh, so you can see by illustration what people are protecting. Uh, also, we offer some comments and suggestions on what to think about in terms of looking at AI-related inventions uh, when, uh, when, uh, being, when looking at uh, also filing for a patent. Next, we're going to look at um, some basic questions. We have fashioned this as our AI and IP drill. Elisa will cover things such as who invents, who owns, how, do, how does one infringe, and some of those very basic questions that a lot of clients present to us. Finally, we'll, we have a uh, forward-looking IP strategy session. Uh, there, Elliot will go through some of the uh, common issues um, when it comes to drafting claims. We have a, a series of claim drafting exercises there to help illustrate some of the points that we wanted to convey today. So let's go to the first topic, what is AI? Um, the, the definition of AI has probably changed over time in terms of uh, what it is and what capabilities are possible with computer implemented components or systems. Generally, I would say that AI is the ability to simulate or mimic aspects of human intelligence with computerized agents or systems. Over time, we've seen systems be deployed commercially that could be generally referred to as fit-for-task type systems, so very specific AI-implemented systems which are used for things such as controlling the, uh, the thermostat in your home. We have the Nest products, for example, um, shopping assistance or speech recognition units that can help you search the internet, load content, play songs. Uh, Amazon's Alexa is one such product in that area. And there are more advanced systems um, in the autonomous vehicle space, for example, where the AI uh, system actually helps you drive the car or 
as we'll see in the future, autonomously drives the vehicle. Those systems are available today. I think people are also looking towards the future and saying what higher levels of intelligence can be mimicked or implemented with computerized components. And in that area, people are discussing things such as general purpose human intelligence, awareness, creativity, and so forth. We haven't yet achieved those levels of sophistication, but many people are speculating that it is within graphs and perhaps within the years to come. Now, if you look at the term artificial intelligence, it's actually not a new term. You'd have to go back to the 50s to see that people were working on artificial uh, intelligence or AI concepts. Actually, the person who was credited for uh, coining the term is John McCarthy. He had proposed a academic, uh, uh, an academic um, project where he wanted uh, the leading minds in the space to come together and explore various AI-related uh, uh, disciplines and concepts. Um, in, in particular, you can see that John McCarthy had speculated that, and I'll just quote what he said, that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. You can see from the proposal, and this is the Dar Darfmouth proposal, uh, that many of the, the things that were identified are, in fact, the key areas of research today. Uh, how do we automate computers? How do we best use computers and write programs to simulate the functions of the brain or human intelligence? How can a computer be used to process words, sentences like a human? Uh, how do we build neuron nets or neural networks to arrange them to analyze or form concepts? Uh, how do we how do we uh, how do we understand the complexity of the problem so that we can more efficiently address it through through AI components? And then also, how do we make machines more intelligent through self improvement and learning? All of these concepts were outlined back in 1955 and then uh, has been worked on since then. And many of today's solutions uh, go back to the work not only in the 1950s, but in the decades following that time. In our first webinar, we looked at some definitions that were presented by various leading AI uh, uh, researchers and professionals. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, people have looked at definitions of AI from things such as thinking rationally or acting rationally all the way to higher levels such as thinking humanly and acting humanly. Again, I don't think the precise definition is uh, too important when we're looking at what can be patented, but realizing that there's been a lot of work in the space since the 1950s, and there's a lot of prior art is one thing to keep in mind, as well as what can be achieved with today, today's technology when you're trying to formulate your claim and protect your invention. Of course, it has to be enabled, concretely described, and uh, something that would be valuable in the commercial space. Uh, we've also learned that, and we can see this from the patent data, that there's a wide range of applications for AI uh, so we, we see today in uh, Internet searches and social networking, Internet of Things. Uh, we're also seeing it in fintech, uh, cybersecurity, and then all the way over to more traditional industries like the automotive space and the chemical and pharmaceutical industries. The reason why we know this is that if we look at where people are investing and where people are pursuing patents, uh, they cover many areas. And this is a slide that we had in the earlier seminar where we showed that over the last 10 years, the total number of uh, patent grants has steadily increased since to, probably 2007. It was pretty much flatlined before then. If you look underneath uh, all of that data and you ask, well, what are people working on and what are they uh, obtaining in terms of patents, you can see that concentrated into several specific areas. Um, this is a keyword clustering just showing uh, those areas, uh, things like machine learning, speech recognition, neural networks, image data, 
facial recognition, and so on, uh, user interfaces. Those are the areas that are garnishing most of the attention today. Of course, in the future, we'll see this uh, widen out to other areas. Okay, next we're going to explore what can be patented. Uh, we've tried to put our thinking around um, what what could be patented in terms of uh, levels of uh, sophistication or, or focus. So we have a couple examples here in the uh, space of system architectures. Then we've looked at uh, data processing, learning and training, and AI embodiment, AI embodied uh, apparatuses and, and methods. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elliot. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, so I, I think one thing that's important to note as we go into some of these samples of different AI patents is that they're not all found within class 706, which is the USPTO class for artificial intelligence. Uh, really, it's a broad and varied field where you see AI inventions that relate to automotive technologies, uh, robotics, uh, software, uh, internet technologies, and many more. So this is one example. This is a patent that is assigned to a company called Numenta. And Numenta is a really interesting company. They have an artificial intelligence platform based on hierarchical temporal memory, which is really a way to mimic the, uh, the neocortex of the brain. So if you go back to Greg's description about different types of AI, you know, one type of AI is really focused on coming up with the, the results that humans would come up with, a result-oriented approach, which could be based on statistical analyses. Uh, this, is a, this is really a, a more pure form of AI that's really trying to model how the brain works and specifically the neocortex. The claim here involves a, a gateway server that performs uh, classification processing based on data sets that it receives. So the, the gateway server will receive certain data sets from, from different clients, and it'll, it'll use this uh, hierarchical temporal memory HTM server to do the processing. And there are two different nodes, and those two different nodes perform the, the type of processing that the neocortex would perform. Uh, they have a, a multi-layer uh, neural network with uh, different weights and different time intervals that are specified. So really, this is a matter of receiving data in a client-server environment and performing artificial intelligence uh, using this HTM technique. Another example of AI we wanted to talk about um, is shown here in this patent from Google. Um, and this patent relates to a convolutional neural network approach. Um, as the patent describes, this is an approach that's really effective uh, for, for analyzing images. So think about a Google search where the, uh, the search is really focused on analyzing images and coming up with uh, similarities between images, trying to classify images. Uh, for example, discriminate between humans and animals. That would be one example of how this, uh, this could be used. And here in the claim, uh, the, the, the claim is really about making the different uh, layers of the neural network parallel. Uh, the patent explains that if the computer processes the different layers in the neural network in a serial fashion, uh, that can be really taxing on computer resources. So part of the invention here is really to parallel eyes uh, the different uh, neural network layers. Uh, so there's a sequence of neural network layers uh, with different layers. There's the convolutional layer, uh, a max pooling layer, uh, a second convolutional layer, and then uh, there's a, a way to, get, to connect the layers, uh, to partially con to connect them uh, in a way that makes the, the processing much, much faster. Now this patent may uh, come as a surprise to some, uh, this is an IBM patent, and it's really focused on uh, pharmaceuticals. And specifically, uh, what this patent deals with is looking at chemicals and predicting whether the chemicals are, A, going to be effective at treating certain uh, diseases, and B, uh, looking at the side effects. So it's really a statistical and artificial intelligence-based approach to determining the effectiveness and suitability of certain chemicals. So in the claims here, it, the, the claims are really recited in, in terms of these, these, these different modules. Uh, there's an indication predictive module, and its job is really to determine whether the chemicals will be effective at treating certain indications or, or diseases or, or issues. So that's really an effectiveness module. Uh, the second module is the side effect predictive module, and that one looks for the, the side effects. So even if a chemical is very effective 
uh, you do want to look at the side effects and determine whether the side effects are too significant to make the drug viable. And then at the at the bottom, there's the correlation engine and the visual visualization tool to present the results. And you know, ideally, the correlation engine would determine uh, chemicals that have the maximum uh, predict the maximum uh, power at treating an indication and the minimum amount of side effects. So this is really an interesting example of IBM uh, trying to solve problems in the, the pharmaceutical space. Another example we wanted to talk about is uh, the Microsoft patent that's shown here. And this, uh, this patent relates to pre-training uh, hidden layers in a deep neural network. And the deep layers in the neural network may be layers that um, involve cognition and, and determinations that are not very clear and not very obvious, but they still need to be trained so that they can be used in combination with other layers to, to make analyses and inferences. So what this claim really involves and what the, the invention involves is training the network layer by layer until a desired number of layers is reached. And obviously in an artificial intelligence embodiment that uses uh, neural networks, you want to minimize the number of layers if you can, uh, because adding more layers adds more computational requirements. And by having fewer layers, uh, you can make the system more efficient. Uh, so this claim is really directed to optimizing the number of layers and also optimizing the weights for the, the different layers. And one thing to note is this is a fairly uh, lengthy claim, and part of the reason perhaps is the, you know, the substantial amount of prior art in the field, as, as Greg was talking about. Um, when we deal with theoretical concepts like neural networks, uh, the prior art really does go back decades. This is perhaps a, a more widely known form of AI shown here. This is uh, an iRobot uh, floor cleaning robot. And um, you know, for those who, who enjoy vivid claim language, the, uh, the, the robot here, uh, the, the robot is claimed in the patent includes a, a cliff detector. And you can imagine how a cliff detector would be helpful uh, when the robot approaches the top of the stairs, for example. Uh, we don't show the claims for this one. Uh, the claims are fairly lengthy. We, we did want to move on to, to this patent here. This is a Garmin patent. And interestingly, this patent is really directed to speech recognition in an in a aircraft environment. So it's really, it's really about helping pilots and others um, in aircraft, like co-pilots and maintenance people, uh, perform tasks, like control tasks and monitoring tasks, uh, verbally in, in, in their aircraft. So what this involves really is a combination of speech recognition and also some artificial intelligence. It allows the uh, pilots to, for example, perform actions like lowering the landing gear by telling the, the system what they want to happen. Uh, there may be an interaction with the system, uh, but really it comes down to the system accurately uh, determining what the, what the pilot or co-pilot is instructing and then performing the function. So you know, when we're thinking about prior art, this is really a matter of two different forms of prior art coming into play. It's a speech recognition prior art, of which there, there's a lot, and then also some artificial intelligence prior art. Next, we have an example uh, from Google. And this is not just simply autonomous driving. This is, this is really trying to solve the problem of transitioning from human driving of a vehicle to autonomous driving. Uh, so really, the problem is, if the human is driving the vehicle in a manual mode, uh, the, the, the vehicle may not know exactly where it is. Uh, but to transition into an autonomous mode, uh, the vehicle needs to know precisely where it is uh, geographically so that it can transition smoothly into, into the, the automatic driving mode. Uh, one other example we have here is a patent from Apple. And this really relates to the, the Siri technology. Uh, this, is, this is really about allowing users to converse uh, casually or conversationally with, uh, with the system. Uh, using language that humans uh, typically use rather than specific uh, predefined commands. And in that way, it's really similar to the other patent we were looking at from Garmin that deals with a combination of AI and uh, speech recognition. And for those who may have seen the recent stories about uh, the, really the IQ tests that were performed for Siri and Google, uh, it's interesting that the IQ numbers have risen over time. 
and uh, they're, I think they're in the 40s or 50s right now. But this is this is one of the patents that relates to the, the Siri technology. And in the claims here, the claims are really about the uh, the speech recognition conversational uh, interface. This is where the the user would uh, be able to speak terms, and the system would understand the terms. And one of the unique features here in the claim is the idea of context information. And as, as described, the, the context information can be things like location or time or personal information or maybe the, the history of the conversation. So if you're thinking about asking, um, if you're asking Siri, um, what kind of computer do you have? And this, the Siri application would tell you the answer. The next question may be, what color is it? And if the question is, what color is it, the system really needs to remember that you're talking about a computer that was referred to in the prior question. That's, that's, a, that's a form of context and artificial intelligence that the, the Siri application would use here. Now, as Elisa is going to talk about in just a, just a minute here, um, it's important to consider patent eligibility um, with AI inventions. Uh, a lot of in AI inventions are recited in terms of the software uh, that they involve, and some also relate to business processes. Uh, so when we think about those things, it's important, obviously, to consider uh, Section 101 and patent eligibility. And as Greg was describing earlier, uh, there is a lot of uh, prior art out there, especially academic prior art, uh, that examiners may not find as easily as they, as they, as they can find patents and uh, printed patent applications. We will also touch on enablement and definiteness, and then also issues of who infringes and how an infringement can occur for AI inventions. So I'll turn it over to Eliza. Thank you, Elliot. So we're now gonna run through some of the common patent issues that arise when dealing with AI technology, including answering questions such as who invents, who owns, can technology incorporating AI be patent eligible or deemed new and non-obvious? And when it comes to patent infringement, who may be liable and how is liability determined? And because there isn't a lot of case law that directly addresses these issues in the context of artificial intelligence, we look to existing case law to provide guidance on these issues. Now, starting with who invents, Patent rights are initially granted to the patent's inventor. So the question of inventorship is key for determining who actually has or owns the rights to a patentable invention. Current case law in the US provides that the inventor of a patent is the individual or individuals who conceive of the invention. And when it comes to joint inventorship, each joint inventor must generally contribute to the conception of the invention. Now this notion of conception sets a pretty high bar. For example, a person that merely follows another's instructions or performs experiments at the direction of another is not generally considered a co-inventor. And this would also apply to AI. For example, if an AI component of a system has image recognition capabilities, that AI's mere ability to identify images would likely not rise to the level of contributing to the conception of the invention. Under existing case law, conception of the invention happens at the point where the invention is a definite and permanent idea of the complete and operative invention. And so as AI advances and has more capability to conceive, and create solutions to problems on its own, policies on inventorship may change. And we actually may not be that far away from such change. Um, you all may have heard about Sophie the Robot, and in Saudi Arabia, she was recently granted citizenship, making her the first humanoid robot to achieve citizenship. So if a robot can be given citizenship, maybe in the future some form of inventorship attribution could also be given to robots. Another requirement of joint inventorship is when multiple people are working together is that they must be aware of each other's work on the invention. And this is a requirement of awareness and that calls for a pretty high form of intelligence and that requirement 
likely impede on whether AI could be considered a joint inventor. If AI doesn't have awareness of what else is being done to create the invention, then it will likely not be considered a joint inventor in the current law. And the current state of artificial intelligence doesn't seem to quite be there yet in terms of achieving awareness. Another general principle um, that can be applied to AI and inventorship is whether the AI is merely adding routine knowledge or skill. If the AI is applying routine knowledge, then that activity would likely not rise to the level of inventor. And so we have a hypothetical that demonstrates these issues and principles. So if you have company A that conceives of a new invention requiring proof of concept and testing, and then you have company B that supplies AI system to perform proof of concept and testing, who's the inventor here? And so the issue is you know, whether the AI system can be considered an inventor in this scenario, well, that will largely depend on how much did the AI actually contribute to the invention. If company A was mostly responsible for identifying the problem and developing a plan to solve that problem, then company A's use of the AI system is no different than using the AI as a mere tool, similar to using a computer to do calculations in that part of the inventor process. So just because an AI system may be considered intelligent, it doesn't necessarily mean that its use or you know, what it performs actually rises to the level of an inventor. You have another hypothetical that kind of draws um, a little bit more issues in a more complicated situation where there's, you know, potentially four different entities involved. And in, in this case, you have company A that develops an AI system and sells it to company B. And then company C provides data and trains the AI system. Company B operates the AI system on company D's resources and serves such as servers in a cloud computing environment. So again, to qualify as a joint inventor, one must contribute to the conception of the claimed invention. Now, company A may have its own patent on the AI system itself, and depending on how it's claimed, it may have rights in any inventive product resulting from the AI system. But focusing just on what the AI generated, there may be an argument that company B that owns the AI machine and company C that provided training material also contributes significantly to the development of any product produced by the AI. So the question becomes, did the individuals at company B identify a problem and develop a plan to solve that problem, which may have included selecting data from company C to train the AI to help solve the problem? Or did company C select the data that trained the AI in a manner that contributed to the AI producing the subject matter of invention to qualify as inventors. Now looking at companies A and D, outside of any contractual considerations, they may also have a claim to inventorship because they produced or operated the AI in a way that created an invention. And so their contribution may be more like the mere tool maker and technician as opposed to that of the inventor but this hypothetical really illustrates how important it is to foresee these types of complex scenarios that can arise from developing and using AI and to have certain agreements in place to account for such situations when collaborating. The next issue um, that we'll discuss is who owns AI? So who owns any inventions created by AI? And generally, ownership invests initially in each inventor absent any agreement to the contrary. And most companies have employment agreements that require an invention created by an employee to be assigned to the company. And as an owner of the patent, you have the right to license the patent in its entirety to others with consent of other, without the consent of the other owners. And this actually could have serious ramifications, especially when it comes to AI. If a company A uses company B's AI tool to create something inventive and it's later determined that the AI tool contributed significantly to the conception of the invention, company B may have inventorship and ownership rights and could possibly impede on company A's ability to sue infringers 
by licensing the invention to potential infringers. So this highlights that when it comes to AI, you really need to sort out any ownership issues. So in the context of ownership, you know, there are a lot of companies that are collaborating with universities and AI experts to develop and implement AI technology in a type of R&D environment. And if you bring AI experts or consult with universities and they're not considered full-time employees, you should make sure that you have agreements in place that assign any inventions to the company. And even if you don't have an assignment clause in place, you know, a company may be able to claim an implied, license, an implied assignment and that's actually what happened in the regions of the University of, Te New, of New Mexico in the New Mexico case. And in that case, even though there was no contract in place, the court found an implied assignment. But generally, you know, it's best to avoid or minimize having to go through a litigation to confirm assignment. And so it's best to check and ensure employment agreements or consulting agreements to determine whether it covers assignment of an invention. So another issue that may commonly come up in the use of AI is that there are a good amount of AI tools and projects that are open to the public. And like any open source code, you know, you should understand the patent policies um, for the IP. And here we provide an example of a Numenta standard GPL patent policy. And here they say that they won't assert patents on this material against you, but they do reserve the right to use its patents that are outside of the GPL in the normal course of business. And so the key thing to take away when using AI tools open to the public is to check the open source agreements and the IP terms. The next issue we'll focus on is whether it's patent eligible. And this is one of the main areas of concerns when it comes to AI, is whether AI can be considered patent eligible, especially post Alice. Another concern um, is whether AI technology can be considered new and non-obvious. So with respect to patent eligibility, we've seen um, the PTO reject claims on the basis that they are directed to a method of organizing human activity and our abstract ideas. Now, if the goal of AI is to replicate human activity, then can it be claimed in a manner that avoids or can overcome a one-on-one -on -one rejection? And the answer is yes. You know, as you know, Greg was talking about earlier and what Elliot was showing um, with all the different patent examples and the different claims, you know, AI is increasingly, the patents in AI are increasing exponentially. And what you see in those patents and in the claims that Elliot had gone over is that the way they claim the AI features, um, they're done in a way in which it's reciting specific technical features. So instead of claiming what the human activity is, the focus is on how the human activity is being performed and reciting in the claims specific technical features. So in other words, the claims shouldn't read on a process done by humans but on the specific AI process apparatus structure claiming those technical features. And so here we provide some tips for avoiding 101 issues. And the USPTO recently issued a memo that emphasizes heavily on the role of the specification in providing evidence of improvement in computer-related technology. And so by using the specification, you can use that as a tool to identify specific problems in the art and technological solutions provided by the invention. It can also describe in detail the technical aspects and embodiments of the invention. And this can be very beneficial because during prosecution, those technical advantages that are described in the specification can be used, to cite, can be used and cited in support of arguments for claims for demonstrating that it's subject matter that's patent eligible and also that it can be distinguishing over what was done before. And this slide continues with our tips for avoiding one-on-one -on -one issues. And the key here is that, you know, the claim should be drafted in a way in which it's rooted in technology. 
And we provide an example of avoiding terminology that reads on mental thoughts. So we have our example here in this table of, you know, an okay way to draft a claim could be determining a crash occurrence. But a better way to draft a claim in a way for that element is to have that it's analyzing a sensor data to determine if it exceeds a crash threshold. And that would be a better way to draft the claim to avoid one-on-one -on -one issues. Also, the claim should also be drafted in a way that recite more than just conventional computer processing steps or functions. Now, another part of you know, whether an AI can be patentable is whether it's new and non-obvious. And although there's been a lot of recent development of AI recently, you know, AI technology, as Greg was saying, has been around since the 1950s. And there's a lot of academic literature on AI that are decades old. And because most examiners, when they do their searches, are focused on patents as prior art, they may not consider what patent, non-patent literature is out there. So that's why the key takeaway here is it's important to conduct non-patent literature searches before filing your patent application to make sure that it's something that can overcome any rejections related to anything that was described in non-patent literature from before. We're now going to look at who infringes when it comes to AI. And under Section 271, it provides that whoever makes, uses, offers to sell, et cetera, in the United States without authority of any patented invention is liable for patent infringement. And courts have generally interpreted whoever to apply to humans. And there's not a lot of cases involved with AI, but there are cases um, involving computerized components. And what we learn from those cases is that the liability typically arises with who is controlling or operating the computerized component. So here we have another hypothetical that's similar to the one that we showed before, but this is now in the context of infringement. And so you have, again, company A that developed an AI application, company B that buys and owns the AI application, company C that provides the data and trains the AI, and company D that allows B to operate the AI application on its resources. And so again, so if the AI produces something that infringes, who's the infringer? And so company B, the owner of the AI machine might be the most obvious target, regardless of whether they had any knowledge of the infringing activity. And then keeping aside any contractual arrangements, company D, which is actually operating the AI, is thus arguably directing or indirectly making the infringing product or practicing the infringing process. And so they may also be considered to be an infringer. And under the current law, an induced infringer is someone who actively induces infringement of a patent. And the Federal Circuit has interpreted this to mean that the alleged inducer must have knowingly aided another direct infringement of a patent. So an argument could be made that Company C, which provided the training data, induced infringement if the company knowingly aided the AI to infringe the patent by providing certain training data that could lead to infringement. And another similar argument could be made for company A that induced infringement if company A instructed company B's use of the AI in a way that company A knowingly aided the AI to infringe the patent. So this example illustrates why it's important to limit liability through contracts and indemnifications to try to foresee these types of issues can come up in collaborating and working with different companies in developing, training, and using AI. And so when it comes to joint infringement, an entity can be responsible for the steps performed by others where that entity either directs or controls the other's performance and where there is a joint enterprise. And this comes from the Akamai case. And the key takeaway here is that when it comes to AI, the thing to consider is the degree AI is performing the infringement. So you must consider who is doing the operating and who is doing the controlling of the AI to determine if there could be some type of joint infringement. 
And now since Akamai applies to method claims, we provide here a counterpart to Akamai on joint infringement as it applies to system and apparatus claims. And similarly, it's an issue of control. The takeaway here is that even if you're merely using an AI tool supplied by another company, you could still be indirectly infringing a system or an apparatus claim even if you don't own the AI. And sometimes when it comes to AI, there may be extraterritorial aspects to the infringement analysis. So some actions like the AI system may be physically located outside of the United States. And so in this situation, you would apply the NTP case. And the use of the claim system, and in that case it says that, the use of the claim system is the place where the system as a whole is put into service, the place where control of the system is exercised. So infringement may be found even if the component is outside of the United States in the case of infringement relating to a system and apparatus claim. But keep in mind that when it comes to method claims, all steps must be performed in the United States to have infringement. So I'm going to turn it over to Elliot, who's going to provide some forward-looking IP strategies and claim drafting strategies when it comes to AI. All right. Thank you, Lisa. So when you're dealing with any new invention and you get the invention disclosure, one of the critical things to think about is how can this invention be used? You know, in what different use cases would this be valuable? Uh, what different industries could this be used in? I, I think these considerations, they're always critical and they're particularly important with AI because if you think about AI algorithms, by their very nature, they often have uh, uses in different industries, sometimes very, very different industries. Um, so this is one thing to keep in mind in terms of AI inventions, and I think it applies even more so when we're dealing with AI. Now, when we take, when, when we consider uh, how to protect AI inventions, it's important to think about the claim drafting as well. Um, I think too often we, we, see, we see patents that have issued or applications that have already been written, and they're really limited to one field of use or one favorite embodiment. Uh, this happens uh, too often. It's, it's, it's really a tragedy when it does happen uh, because it's a tough thing to fix, obviously, um, if you can fix it at all. And I think what we, what we need to emphasize is the, the idea of looking a little bit into the future, looking into the, uh, the, uh, the eight ball a little bit and determining with the inventors where the invention can be used in the future. So I think the takeaway here is good patent prosecution practice. Uh, really does apply even more so in the AI context. Uh, take a hypothetical, a very simple hypothetical. Um, we have a shopper robot, and the, the invention here is to have a robot that, uh, that navigates a shopping uh, store together with customers and uh, helps them buy things. Um, so that's one embodiment, obviously. Where else can an invention like this be used? Uh, what about restaurants, you know, delivering food? Uh, hotels, carrying bags, bringing people to their rooms? Uh, airlines is another example, concierge services and reception desks. Um, it's important to not only think about these things and brainstorm with inventors when you're, when you're coming up with uh, an application, um, but also to, um, to describe them when you, when, you're, when you begin running the application. Now, to, to walk through some of these issues, we thought it would be helpful to present an invention, and we, we tried to make the invention not too complex so that it could be uh, something that people can actually read and uh, understand in the time we have here. So this is an invention of a shopper robot, like we saw in the previous slide. It has an image capture device, so it can capture an image of a product, like a shoe, for example, that a, a customer is looking at. And then next, we have our artificial intelligence engine. Um, and uh, the, the purpose of that is to come up with purchase recommendations, and then at the end of the claim, display those on the display. And I think for many in the audience, when we see the term artificial intelligence engine, uh, that raises a tremendous amount of, of questions. Um, it really raises more questions than it, it, uh, it provides answers to. Um, and in particular, uh, we should be thinking about 112 issues. Is this going to be interpreted under 112F as a means plus function term? Uh, in other words, is the term engine merely functional? Um, and then also 101 issues. Um, if, if a court or an examiner saw this claim, uh, they may well say, look, you're, you're just claiming an abstract idea of an artificial intelligence engine being used uh, in a shopping robot. So how can we fix the claim? 
Well, one way to improve it would be to get rid of the term artificial intelligence engine and maybe replace it with something a little bit more particular, like an inference engine, inference engine um, performing uh, statistical analyses, statistically developing at least one purchase recommendation. This may make the claim perhaps a little more definite and, and less, uh, less uh, undefined if, if we were thinking about the term artificial intelligence engine from the previous slide. You know, that could mean a lot of different things. This, this is at least a little bit more specific, uh, but perhaps it's still a little bit abstract and they have patent eligibility issues. So maybe a better way to word this is to get rid of the engine concept, um, but actually say what the engine is doing. So for example, if the invention is really about capturing images and applying a neural network, uh, you can recite that in the claim. Uh, here we have a multi-layer neural network with uh, different uh, layers being trained and the different layers having different weights. And then it's really the output of the neural network that provides the, the shopping recommendation. Uh, I think this, this claim here would do a better job uh, getting through the patent office or a court in terms of 112 and also 101. Uh, the question really would be, is there prior art? And as Greg and Elisa both talked about, the prior art uh, relating to neural networks does go back many decades. And I think we can all safely assume that image recognition and neural networks are both uh, well known. So for a claim like this, the thing to think about would really be, is the combination of features known? And if it is, if, if it would be an obvious combination of features, uh, what else can be recited in the claim to, to push the claim beyond the, the finish line in terms of novelty and non-obviousness? Now, obviously there's a trade-off because in claims like this, there's a need to, uh, to recite um, at least some steps of the algorithm. Often for AI inventions, it's, it's a portion of the algorithm, after all, that is new and inventive. And if it's necessary to recite that in the claim, uh, there's a trade-off between getting too specific and too general. If you get too specific, obviously, um, it can be hard to find infringement. There may not be infringement, and it further may be easy to, to design around that kind of claim. One other thing to think about, and this relates to what Elisa was talking about, is the notion of where is the activity happening? So in an example like this, if the robot is communicating with a backend server to perform the AI processing, and that server happens to be located outside of the United States, well, that could be, issue, that could be an issue. If this is a method claim, for example, uh, that, could be, that could be a basis for non-infringement. If it is a, a system claim like we have here, and it's really a matter of asking ourselves uh, who is controlling the system, uh, who is providing the data, who is determining how the system will, will operate. All right, I think with that, um, that, is a, that, that, that's a good way to summarize these different uh, licensing and enforcement issues, and also prosecution issues that can come up with, uh, with AI inventions. Uh, again, it's really gonna come down to, in many cases, this trade-off between uh, being too particular and being uh, a little bit more broad with, your, with, your, with how you claim the algorithm. And when you're thinking about these things too, the other thing to consider is whether to reserve certain inventions as trade secrets. If really where you're coming out is that to, to claim it, uh, you would have to claim it in such a narrow way that it would be very hard to determine infringement for, and it would be very easy to design around. Uh, those are considerations that may encourage you to reserve a particular invention is a trade secret uh, rather than file a patent application for it. But uh, that's really a trade-off that is uh, something to consider on a case-by-case on a -case basis. All right, and I think we have reserved uh, 10 minutes for questions here at the end. So we uh, look forward to the, the audience's questions. Uh, thank you, Elliot, and uh, thank you, Elisa. Um, before we begin the question and answer, uh, uh, portion of our webinar, we ask that each of you take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey as we strive to provide uh, programs of value and, and continually improve on our webinars. We would appreciate your input, particularly uh, for planning and uh, developing future programs. Let's now turn to questions that we've received, and uh, there's a good number of questions coming in. Uh, we have we have a few moments here uh, to address some of the more common questions that we're receiving today. Some of them are on the patenting side and others are on the, on the side of, uh, of infringement. 
So let's turn first to the uh, the question of patenting and what is patentable in the AI space. Um, we, we've covered a good number of topics already uh, as to what is patentable and, and things to consider in terms of uh, drafting claims and so forth. One of the questions that came in, and uh, maybe, Elisa, you could address this, is how do you ad adequately capture an AI invention? Um, I guess that draws on questions like, is it sufficiently developed for filing? Uh, how much detail do you need to put into the application and so forth? Elisa, do you have some thoughts there? Yeah, sure, Greg. So one of the things to do when capturing AI inventions at the source is you want to keep track of certain things to make sure that you can meet the requirements for you know, obtaining a patent. And so when it comes to AI, you want to keep track of any rule sets that are being used or training data sets that can be used to train the, the AI that could maybe possibly create a patentable invention, keeping track of any software or hardware platform independence, and also sufficiently providing an enabling description, especially if the AI is able to create or come up with solutions on its own. You also want to keep track of what's the best mode of the invention and Finally, um, you know, there may be some parts of it that you may want to keep as a trade secret. So, if, you know, if there's anything uh, relating to the technology that you want to keep outside of the public knowledge, then that may be something that you should determine whether it's more appropriate to keep that aspect as a trade secret. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Elliot, did you have any follow-on comments there? Yeah, I think a lot of that is going to come down to the algorithms, uh, like, like Eliza was saying. Uh, the algorithms are going to be key for a lot of AI inventions um, to satisfy the, the two 112 uh, hurdles, uh, enablement and also written description. And, you know, if we, if we look back at a lot of these claims that we saw in the, in the samples today, these are, these are real claims from big companies. Uh, a lot of them use the term module or engine, as, as, as we can see. And as we know from cases like the Williamson case, when we use terms like that, um, we, we, we run the risk, if not the, <laughs> the high likelihood, of getting a subject to 112F. And if we're, if we're subject to 112F, we need disclosure, ideally, of not just one algorithm, but many different algorithms, um, preferably tied to many different use cases. So I, I think when we're dealing with inventors, um, it's, it's key to, to identify uh, many different variants on the algorithms and then also explain how they can be used in, in different ways. Okay, very good. Um, let's take let's take one or two questions. <clears throat> excuse me, on the infringement side, um, Ellie, I'll come back to you. Uh, someone asked whether they uh, whether we think that there'll be an uptick in AI patent litigation as as uh, more patents are filed in the space. What do you think? Yeah. That's that's certainly a good question, and we saw the slide that Greg presented on the, the increase of patent grants uh, relating to AI over time. Um, I, I, my answer, uh, that my, my prediction is that it's really going to be, there's going to be an increase, but maybe not as dramatic as we saw um, over the last maybe decade in areas like mobile, mobile phones, uh, Internet technologies, and software technologies. And I think there's going to be continuing interest in funding and patent grants relating to, to AI. I think that's all going to continue. Um, one thing that may not lead to as much litigation um, is really the notion that um, it can be hard to detect infringement of certain AI claims. So if a claim is granted and it's fairly narrow um, or it involves some back-end technique that is not, you know, it's not available through a, a HTTP trace or it's not available through marketing literature to discover, um, those are things that can pre prevent a company from, from filing a lawsuit uh, based on a, a claim like that. Um, so to the extent AI innovations are, you know, they involve technologies that are hidden from view or that are difficult to confirm infringement of, I think that is something that may uh, slow the speed of, uh, of litigation activity uh, for AI technologies. Yeah, I would concur on that. And also we've seen uh, an uptick, although in some specific spaces, highly commercially valuable spaces like cybersecurity, and I suppose we may see uh, follow-on litigations, um, particularly where you have high high, uh, high interest and uh, commercial value. Uh, also, we are seeing trade secret litigation um, in the space if, if you look at the Google 
or Waymo v. Uh, Uber case. Another question was, uh, and, and Lisa, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. Uh, can there be liability for infringement if the AI system affirmatively performs the steps of the claim without <laughs> without uh, control or direction from the owner of the AI system? Yeah, and that's, that's a, tough that's a really good I'm not, question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the case law has actually addressed that, obviously. But why don't you why don't you give right. it a shot? Yeah, and I think um, you know, especially as AI becomes more advanced, you know, this issue may become you know more common. And so I think the issue here for determining infringement in this type of scenario is can it be reasonably foreseen whether the AI system would infringe? And if so, the owner or user of the AI system could be liable for infringement. But then in the case where it could not be reasonably foreseen that the AI would independently perform steps required by a claim, then maybe as this scenario becomes more prevalent, this is where we may start seeing a shift in the law to account for these types of situations. Yeah, you know, it also, for me, it also, um, uh, raises some of the earlier cases we've seen, not necessarily directed to AI, but cases in the space of indirect infringement. And um, if you supply something that causes the infringement, here it would be an AI system, you may be liable for inducement or contributory infringement. And of course, we also have those cases addressing willful blindness and how there could still be infringement if you could have reasonably expected um, what you've provided to 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 cause the infringement, and 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 there's many cases in in that area as well. It comes to inducement. Um, with that, I think we will uh, conclude today's webcast AI and IP forward-looking strategies. We thank everyone for participating today. This presentation will be available on demand in the next week. Again, please take a look at our website where you'll find this webinar as well as other materials available for download, playback, and viewing. Uh, please also look out for an email from us with the access link for this particular webinar. And again, we thank all of you for participating today. This concludes today's Finnegan's webcast. Thank you.